Greetings, my name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 102, The Digital Doctorate. This vlog has been percolating for quite some time and it's had multiple requests that I've brought together into, as you can see, a paradigm shift for doctoral education. So where are these requests from? The wonderful Steph. Hi Steph. Steph's supervisor left the campus, left the university, and she wanted to know how some form of supervisory relationship could continue outside of South Australia. Steph, answer in the next half an hour or so in this vlog. To the wonderful Catherine, uh, who has asked me on multiple occasions how we invest the off-campus candidature with meaning and texture and more content. Kath, this is for you. And this vlog is, of course, dedicated to the right bunch. The right bunch is a group of people that get together once a week via Skype from all over the world, and we write together for half an hour. But we talk and chat, and we help each other through the candidature. And the right bunch particularly want to, because the bulk of them live way outside of South Australia uh, in Canada. <laughs> hi everyone in Canada, hi to wonderful Julie. Uh, and they want to know how we use the right bunch as perhaps a trope or a strategy to think more broadly about doctoral education. So guys, to the right bunch, this is dedicated to you. And this is not just an issue for Flinders University or indeed any individual university. This is a systemic change. But Flinders, I think, is a great example of what we need to do. One third of our students live outside of South Australia and one third of our students are part time and they're not the same third. So this means that the majority of our students are disconnected in some form from a physical campus. So all the assumptions we have, the old fashioned assumptions about supervision, about there's a student and there's a supervisor in the same space. Well, that really doesn't exist anymore, and I would argue it hasn't existed now for some decades. But for every single student, even if you live in Adelaide and you live and work in and around our Flinders campus, this is going to be relevant to you, and I'll tell you why. Your supervisor will go on sabbatical or holiday, and what are you going to do when they're away from the campus? And of course, what about you? At some point in your candidature, you might decide that you're going to take a job or family responsibilities become very significant to you. And all of a sudden, those analog expectations about physical relationships in space in your candidature suddenly dissipate. So what are you going to do? So the notion that a student and a supervisor both work and will meet in Bedford Park or Tonsley or Sturt is simply not a reality for the bulk of our students. And of course it's not going to be a reality for the bulk of our students through three years of a candidature and that's the point I'm making to you now because the higher education sector right now is incredibly volatile. The idea that you and your supervisor will share a physical space at the start of the candidature and at the end of the candidature is naive. Okay, Three years is an incredibly long time. Three years ago I was working in a different university in a different state and three years before that I was working in a different university in a different country. We're dealing with a precariat workforce guys. We can't predict where we're going to be in three years time. I couldn't tell you where I'm going to be in three months time. That is the reality of higher education and if you think your supervisor and you're going to be here in three years time guys that simply may not be the case so in your head you've got to have systems and strategies and policies in place to understand how you'll manage the vagaries of higher education and the higher education workforce so that you finish that phd the question is how you're going to manage this volatility and that's why i want to introduce two shapes to you. Love a bit of shape work, love a bit of shape work. And so I've got two shapes to introduce to you today. The first one is a very simple one. It's a horizontal line moving from admissions through to progression through to examination. That's your candidature. So think a horizontal line and how you move through those stages. The second shape, as you see, features quadrants. And like there are four of them, like duh. They're analog, digital, 
asynchronous and synchronous. Now each of these four squares are important, are significant to your PhD and each square talks to the other one. So they have specific applications for you and your behaviour through your PhD and your relationship with your supervisor. So just to give you a few examples, digital synchronous is Skype, digital asynchronous is email, analog synchronous is a face-to-face -face meeting in your supervisor's office, but analog asynchronous may be me downstairs reading a paper draft of my students' work. So all of them, all of the squares have different relationships. And there's so many productive applications and behaviors that can occur if we think about the new types of relationships that can emerge. And by the way, this theory, this trope, this structure is mine, so please feel free to use it. I am writing it up as a refereed article right now, and it is becoming a book called The Digital Doctorate. But what I intend to do is, I've actually formally done, and sort of not on a whiteboard, I've formally done these two shapes on a handout for you that I'll do links to and the, in the information bit of this YouTube video. So you can really print it out and have a ponder, have a reflection on how these quadrants impact on your career. So let's just quickly whack in four definitions of each of these terms. Right, so synchronous is in real time. So a communication event occurs in real time. Asynchronous, that means a communication event is staggered. So an event occurs, but there is a delay before the next communication event. So if you're having, for example, a synchronous conversation, I speak, you answer, I speak, you answer. But for example, this vlog is an example of asynchronous digital communication. So I'm speaking, and then many of you come and send me an email or come into my office, have a chat with me later on after you've seen it, right? Synchronous, asynchronous, a delay between communication events. Cool. Analog, ah, oh, one of my favorite words on this planet. And its etymology is really diverse. It comes from bio, comes from chem, a little bit of medicine, a little bit of computer science, and a little bit of internet studies. So analog, of course, via bio, refers to an organ or a part that is similar to, or indeed derivative from, another part or organ. But analog, I think, is best captured or explained by thinking about an analog clock. And particularly in terms of analog as an adjective, this is quite meaningful. So analog as an adjective refers to how data is represented on a continuity scale. So think of it like those hands on a clock face, right? An analog clock, the hands are continually moving. In fact, you can't see the movement. They're just gently and continually moving through time. Yeah? Compare that to a digital clock. 2.34, click. 2.35, click you don't see that smooth continuity in the representation of data, or in this case, time. So analog, via this definition, this then leads into computer science and internet studies, analog is that which is not digital. So it's been used in internet studies to describe physical objects. So that's bodies, but also objects in physical space. They have physical qualities that are different from digitization, pixelation, and screens. So via this new definition, analog and digital are binary oppositions. So bodies versus screens. But it's also used pejoratively in, in internet studies. So you're so analog, meaning you're not modern, you're not digital. We're not using it like that today. So digital is the culture, the media, the economy that's founded and developed through binary codes. So for me, the characteristic of digitization is mobility. Redundancy is reduced through packet switching. So information moves through space and time. That is digitization. So the point of thinking about analog and digital, asynchronous and synchronous in doctoral education means that I want us to start talking about architectures of identity. This is a big phrase right now, architectures of identity. So what it's suggesting is who you are 
transforms through digitization, deterritorialization, and disintermediation. So that means new opportunities exist for how you present your spa yourself in different spaces, different times, different portals, different interfaces. So what I'm arguing for today is you as a PhD student start to think about how your architectures of identity transform when you summon one or more of these quadrants in interesting ways. And just to remember, just because a technology exists doesn't mean it remotely is going to help your doctoral candidature. What I'm asking when we're thinking about technology that you demonstrate consciousness. Just because tech exists doesn't mean it should be used and certainly doesn't mean that it's used well. So think about your learning outcomes, what you want to achieve through this PhD and that will determine, I think, which of these quadrants become important to you through each of the stages of your candidature. So let's now talk about this life cycle of a PhD student, admissions to progression through to examination. And let's start with admissions. A big hi to everyone out there who's about to start or who is thinking about starting a PhD. And can I say, I am absolutely staggered that students don't shop for supervisors more overtly. I'm absolutely staggered that students are just so thrilled to be accepted into a PhD program. You're a PhD student, you are precious the world wants you, okay? So you should be shopping for the best supervisor for you. So what to look for when you're shopping for a supervisor? Are they intensely research active? Are they research active? Do they know publishers? Do they know people, right? That's important to you. Secondly, are they a decent human being? More important <laughs> than you could possibly imagine. So is this person actually decent and ethical? Do they face the table when they eat? Okay, this sort of stuff is quite important. How do these supervisors treat their students? And all sorts of information exists about that. And do they finish their students in the minimum time? All these data sets are available and you should access them. So this is digital asynchronous material. Look down their Twitter feed, look at LinkedIn, see what's available on Facebook, check what sort of person this supervisor is. So then at that point, summon the synchronous conversation, either analog or digital. Go into their office and have a chat or indeed phone them up on Skype, so digital synchronous. So use the synchronous elements to check that this person really is the best supervisor for you. Also, and look, students don't do this enough, talk to other students that that, that supervisor has supervised, okay? Use Twitter, use LinkedIn, use Facebook, use email, talk to the students. The students invariably will tell you the truth. Whenever I'm you know, possibly thinking about taking on a student these days, the first thing I say is, talk to three or four of my students, here's a list of 15, talk to them and see if my style of supervision suits you. So there should be no reason for any surprises these days. There's that much digital material available on every single one of us, there should be no surprises. Okay, so you found a great supervisor admissions. You found a great supervisor by digital or analog means. Let's go to progression. This is where the bulk of you are right now. So you are enrolled in a candidature. What exactly is that going to look like if we think about these four quadrants? Well, I'm going to focus on meetings, milestones, and feedback. Okay, they're the key bits that are going to move you through to examination. Right, all the research shows the characteristic of students that finish in three years is a weekly meeting. Full stop. And remember that weekly meeting can be 30 minutes, but a weekly meeting is the characteristic of a student who gets through in three years. But where it gets interesting, and this is really what changed my life about six years ago when I started developing this model, is the research suddenly showed that it didn't matter if those meetings were digital or analog. So that meant, it didn't matter if the meetings were via Skype or in somebody's office. It just mattered that they were synchronous, right? So therefore, off-campus students right now have as much opportunity for that quick PhD candidature as someone on the campus because of the synchronous Skype meetings. So remember, 
the key, if you want to get through quickly, the key is a synchronous meeting. And it doesn't matter if it's digital or it's analog. So let's move to feedback, the other area where there's a lot of complaints from students. Now feedback can and should be delivered digitally or via analog means. But remember, feedback is always really asynchronous. There's a gap between you presenting work and you receiving feedback. Now the challenge comes in with students, the length of that gap between you presenting the work and receiving the feedback from your supervisor. Now this is the rub with the system because what is the right amount of time to expect feedback from your supervisor? Now I try to get everything back to my students in a week. It is sometimes challenging. Obviously if I can do it in a day I will. If I get a piece of work and I've got an afternoon free then I will try and do that work in real time and return it to my students. And you know those 10 drafts I do with my students at the end we try and do in 10 weeks so that means a draft a week. But also there's no doubt that feedback is one of the big areas of complaint from students. They do not receive, and I'll use the adjective, timely feedback. Now I understand the frustration there, I really do, and actually I understand it from both sides. What I'd ask though, that students do talk with their supervisors about what timely feedback means. So when you present a piece of work, be kind to your supervisor and say, you know, Phil, thanks so much for accepting this work. What's your next week look like, mate? What's the next week look like? When do you think I'll get this back? Ask them. Don't be frightened, but just ask. And as academics, we will be honest with you. And just something from an academic perspective to remember is we don't control about 90% of our work day. Okay, about 90% of our work day is timetabled and organised. Right? We have flexibility in about 10% of our day, and that's when we mark our undergraduate work, mark our honours work, mark our master's work, and give you as PhD students feedback. Can I say it's also the time where we as researchers do our research. So what you're picking up is in the academic system, there isn't a lot of flexibility, guys, if I'm honest with you. And that's why every now and again bad stuff happens. So the week before last, I received five PhD drafts in one day. So I had 480,000 words that were presented to me in one day. And it just happened to be, as always, the week where meetings are everywhere, I'm losing full days, you can imagine the nightmare. Now I managed to finish three of those five drafts in five days. So that was great. So three of the drafts went back and I went, right, well the last two, I'll do one on the Saturday and do one on the Sunday. Okay, but of course, much to my horror, one of my wonderful students, of course, emailed me on Friday, one of the two I hadn't finished, and said, right, well, where is my draft? And so I just wanted to kill myself. I just wanted to throw myself off a balcony going, I'm working as quickly as I can. I, I'm, I'm not breathing. I'm doing work while I'm on the toilet. I mean, this is getting really involved here. So I, I got really upset at myself that I thought, oh, look, I'm just not really doing enough here, right? So... And of course then she got the draft back on the Sunday, I worked all day for her on the Sunday to get that draft back. So do be a bit kind with your supervisors because sometimes we do have those shocking weeks and every single student submits work at the same time. So do remember they want to read your work but their asynchronous time that's available to offer feedback is often very, very limited, particularly during term time. Yep. Yeah? So feedback is crucial, and it is important, and Alex, I know you disagree with me, feedback is crucial, but it is important that you move between analog and digital feedback. So what I would argue is paper drafts and screen-based drafts pick up different things. So it is important, I think, to move between the drafting modes, between analog and digital. Okay, milestones. Now I know Julie, you have big interest in this and this is the bit of the vlog that I wrote for you, my love. So there is absolutely no reason why an off-campus student should have to travel to the campus to deliver their milestone event, full stop. Now I know that colleagues disagree with me and I'm just sorry, but I'll be really clear on this. I cannot see any reason why somebody should have to get on a flight leave their family, their friends, spend all that money to get a flight in a hotel, you know, 18 hours of travel to deliver a one hour seminar. That just does not make sense to me at all. 
20 years ago it might have, but now, right now, it seems bonkers. Because we've got Skype, we've got Adobe Connect, we've got Zoom. So it is possible to have a synchronous digital milestone event. So someone is not travelling from Alberta uh, to, to deliver a one-hour seminar. That seems crazy to me. It is no longer required, okay? Also remember that digital asynchronous, so digital asynchronous options are also available. So as part of your milestones, we are ask that you show oral communication skills, right? That doesn't mean you travel to Bedford Park and you deliver a seminar. You could use podcasts, you could use videos like this to show that you're able to communicate your ideas. So digital asynchronous is available and you simply show that link on your milestone. And if I can just do a shout out to my wonderful namesake, Tara, the wonderful Tara from Speech Pathology. You rule, Tara. Tara uses sonic memos on her phone. So this is a way that she does those quick, uh, synchronous note-taking events. So she's in clinical practice and she has an idea. She summons the memo on her phone and in real time, she just quickly outlines an idea that she has for later asynchronous digital write-up and reflection. So for our clinical colleagues and scholars, this is a really, really great idea. So use the sonic digital synchronous for later reflection. What I'm asking, I think, and Tara's example is a great one, is think creatively about your use of that quadrant through your candidature. There will be synchronous moments where you have to bring it, but remember, those synchronous moments do not have to be in a real place. They can be shared time, but not shared space. Deterritorialization for me, is the key characteristic of digitization, which makes it so valuable. So we share time, we don't have to share space. So this is really exciting because it means you can be supervised from anywhere in the world, you can receive feedback from anywhere in the world, and yes, you can do your milestones from anywhere in the world. So let's finish with examination. I'd like to do a big shout out to our examination team, the wonderful Nat, Layla and Beck, you rule. With a lot of pride, I can say that Flinders University PhD examinations are completely, completely digital. We use asynchronous digital with, I think, a lot of care. So your supervisors nominate examiners digitally. They are approved through the college structure and the Office of Graduate Research digitally. You do your Turnitin report digitally, which is checked. Your theses are then sent out digitally and your examiners return their report. Yes, digitally. So the full capacity of asynchronous digitization is deployed through your examination. This is so exciting because it means your examiner can be the best person on this planet. And if they're attached to the internet, we're going to be able to deliver that thesis to you quickly. So it gets there immediately and it is returned very, very quickly. So it speeds up the examination process enormously. Now also, if we ever move to oral exams, who knows, team? If we ever move to oral exams, of course, this makes no difference at all. But because of Skype, because of Zoom, because of Adobe Connect, it means that we can simply do an oral exam via digital synchronous means. And of course, I've, as my wonderful husband Steve has done, we've done more of these online digital oral examinations than we can count. And in fact, I was thinking about it this morning. I did my first PhD oral exam digitally in 2008, I was in Eastbourne and the candidate was in Crewe up in the northwest and it went incredibly well. But that was 2008, that was 10 years ago, and the tech's improved since then. So you can see how your milestones and all the work we do with feedback and examination can play between these four quadrants, but particularly digital synchronous and digital asynchronous. We can really work this system now. Now, obviously, for different disciplines, the relationship between these four quadrants is going to be quite different in your candidature. So I just want to go through sort of the big suite of how those relationships might be a bit different. So for the lab-based disciplines, whether it's clinical education or whether it's the harder in science and engineering, you're probably least affected by asynchronous and synchronous digitization. So asynchronous and synchronous digitization. So your candidature doesn't change too much. And the reason is, of course, you're doing bench work, you're doing lab work. So it has an asynchronous element to it. But 
your feedback component does transform radically. So if you're doing the old fashioned style of a PhD, so you're doing the bench work, you're doing the lab work, and then you're doing the writing up period of the thesis at the end. So you're doing the experiments and writing it up at the end. Odd phrase that we use, but they still exist as a mode of doing a PhD. Then that writing up phase can happen anywhere. And as we're increasingly seeing, our wonderful students are getting a job in the final six months and then they're writing their thesis up while in this job at a very remote location and digitally keeping in connection with their supervisor to offer them feedback. So digital synchronous and asynchronous might dominate the end point of your candidature but analog synchronous will continue to dominate I think the lab based candidature okay but all sorts of options are available as I said in that writing up period so think about that for our students in the social sciences this is a really exciting time particularly if you're in anthropology or in doing any form of ethnography, I would argue, sociology, incredibly exciting work, something with field work elements. Your life, your research life is transforming. So when you are in the field, you are living asynchronously, but you're also particularly living analog synchronously. You're living, you're experiencing the field in real time, but your reflection on it is asynchronous and digital. So this is fantastically interesting in terms of reflection on ethnography. You're also going to be able to keep in touch with your university and your supervisor while you're in the field and again that's brand new and interesting and enabled through digitization and particularly deterritorialization. So for our ethnographers you're balancing analog and digital synchronous and asynchronous in really really innovative ways and it's transforming the very theory of ethnography. Incredibly powerful. But I think probably some of the most exciting developments are occurring in the theoretical theses right now. Often a lot of these are located in the humanities, but all sorts of fantastic theoretical theses happen in physics, in mathematics, and also science communication, science literacy is really going to become a growth area in the next 10 years or so. But digitization really is transforming these theoretical theses. In previous years, much to my horror, theoretical theses used to be referred to as desk research. So you're doing desk research. How incredibly boring, yawn. Well now, the desk is actually a TARDIS and you are a Time Lord because your desk travels. Through digitization and the open access movement, you can engage with the most rich, evocative, powerful, passionate, edgy material on this planet right now. This is a very exciting time for you. You are not limited by your body. You are not limited by the limitations of what your desk is doing or your library is doing. This is brilliant. You are fully deterritorialized. You are a time lord. Remember this. But it also means that if you're an inverted commas desk researcher, you can select the best supervisor on this planet. You're not limited to an office, you're not limited to a library or an archive, you can find the best person for your project. So this means, particularly if you're not on scholarship, and in Australia about two thirds of our students are not on scholarship, a much higher proportion of non-scholarship holders exists in other nations obviously, but if you're not on scholarship, then you can seek out the best supervisor on earth and that person will supervise you to completion in the minimum time. You're not limited to, limited to what's happening in Adelaide or what's happening in Singapore, what's happening in Christchurch, or what's happening in Johannesburg. You're not limited to any of that stuff. Where your body is, is not where your thesis needs to be. So we're now at a point in supervision and examination where you can be in one location, your supervisor can be in another, and it makes absolutely no difference. How exciting is this? So what I've tried to do in this vlog and indeed through this quadrant is make you aware of all sorts of options that are available to you now and perhaps in the future and also when you are supervising and examining. So don't think for one moment that how your supervisor was supervised is how you should be supervised. The world has changed not only in 20 years or 10 
but it's changed in the last two. These are really exciting times. We have these four quadrants, analog, digital, synchronous, asynchronous, and they combine in innovative and new ways to transform what we do in doctoral education. So have a think what suits you, what suits your partner, what suits your family, what suits your workplace now and going into the future. You've heard me say so often, team, that digitisation gives PhD students power. You have power to choose. You have power to create a customised, bespoke candidature that suits your life and your future. And isn't that exciting? So think about the architectures of your identity and how it creates an architecture of your supervision. So exciting, exciting times. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.